All right. Thanks so much, and it's a great uh, to have an opportunity to be here. Um, I've been working with a, an organization called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which I co-founded, several other uh, folks, and it's really about trying to get so we can actually share uh, large amounts of genomic data. The problem is we are going from an era of uh, small studies uh, that are funded by uh, grant agencies to an era where human data will be collected on a massive scale in the millions from clinical activities, and those data will be totally inaccessible for research unless there's a change in the way things are done, and we're trying to implement that change. There are a number of working groups within the Global Alliance that are tackling different issues, regulatory, compliance, legal, um, and uh, I'm working with Richard Durbin on representing the data in a format that is more amenable to the very large scale uh, analysis. Currently, we're a little bit bogged down with exchanging these large files, the BAM files and the VCF files are getting, even the VCFs are getting big. And if you have a million of these uh, and you try to run algorithm on it, it just uh, bogs down with I.O. at this point. So we need, a, need a, a new way of representing these large databases of genomes in a format that's more abstract than a file format. So companies like uh, Google or Amazon or Microsoft or Illumina can compete on the, in the back end to create uh, these efficient databases with API queries, and then you can write your code to that API to get information out of these databases. So a little bit where I'm coming from. In the context of this discussion, we had a number of thoughts about the human genome. This is just kind of generic background to begin with, but uh, the obvious thing about it is we have currently a, uh, a, a, an enormous amount of human variation, but our reference genome structure um, is used to, for most of the activities. In other words, if you can't map to this linear reference genome structure, a lot of stuff is getting ignored. And Worse than that, we have different procedures for mapping to the, the same reference genome, and so results end up being incomparable because people map or think about mapping in different ways. So these are key problems that we have at this point. Um, in fact, because uh, of the complex nature of some DNA within our genome, there are uh, estimated between 23 and 29 million nucleotides uh, within a typical genome that simply cannot be mapped by most mapping procedures to the uh, current reference genome. And there are a, a large number, estimated about 5% of the genome by work and by Eichler and others, that are in these large uh, segmental duplications. And those are not only variable within people, but very hard to map because you have nearly identical or identical DNA over large stretches in two different places within the reference genome. So this does create a huge problem. And the idea is not to keep sweeping this under the rug, essentially, like we're currently doing, to think about uh, something uh, that will approach this. So um, and, and the effects we hope to have are uh, even even on functional transcribed genes, we have this multi-mapping problem. We have some of them are broken in the reference uh, because it's only representing one version, which happens to be a broken version, and, and some are completely absent. Uh, so it's, it's a mistake to think, well, we don't really need to think about these complex regions of the human genome. They do contain uh, important, important information, and we can't compete, com continually ignore them. More than this, as we start to understand human ge generic variation, we start to look at some of the population, subpopulations that Carlos and others have been talking about. Uh, we, need a, we need a way to capture that variation as well, uh, if in the sense that it is specific to a subpopulation. What, so what's going on? The current reference genotype is a linear, uh, the reference uh, genome is a linear structure fundamentally uh, that we use and we see in our browsers. However, there's a recognition that there is structural diversity, and so we have a proliferation over the last two iterations of the reference genome. And you may be aware that there's a new one that's cooking through the pipelines. Um, we'll call it HD38 to be in sync with NCI, uh, uh, NCBI uh, at, at Santa Cruz, and it will replace the current HD19 version that we have. And all of these red 
uh, arrows indicate places where there's now an alternate haplotype or one or more alternate haplotypes that are actually DNA sequences that have positions within the current HG38 reference. The problem, again, being that there's no clear rule for how one maps to one or the other. And there are cases where, in fact, these things essentially overlap on their ends purposefully to essentially anchor them to the one uh, path that's sometimes called the golden path from the, the old days when we did the first assembly of the genome. Um, the reality of this is that the structure that is actually described by that HG38 reference genome is a graph, not, not, uh, it's a more complicated graph, not simply a linear set of sequences. And in fact, if you include the mitochondrion, uh, we can have circular uh, sequences as well. And so we are going to propose a rigorous representation of a reference genome as a sequence graph. All right, a sequence graph is a very, very simple object. Here's uh, a description of it. So each base instance, uh, this C or this C or any other C, T, or A, is represented by a structure which has the base and then has a, a UUID or some stable identifier. And this is nice because when we go on to the next version of the genome, HG39, that UUID won't change. It will never change. This is the idea. Uh, so we will be adding more material possibly, but never subtracting something away from our reference. And of course, the universe of UUIDs is, is plenty so that you won't have collisions until you have, until every person has uh, something like uh, millions and 600 million UUIDs just for themselves or something like that. I think that's when you start getting collisions under the 122-bit UUID. But we don't have to go into the details of that. So we think about this as a stable identifier. And then this uh, little arrow here, is there a pointer? Or I can probably point with my finger. Uh, these little arrows are uh, essentially bi-directional edges because they're not connecting the nodes, but they're connecting the sides of the node. So every base has a left side and a right side, or a three prime and a five prime side, if you prefer. And those uh, sides are what are adjacent to each other in the reference genome. Thank you. That's great. And, um, and so uh, each one of these edges actually has uh, a, a distinct label, which is either an outgoing arrow or an ingoing arrow on each end, or each incidence at each end of that. And that's technically called a bi-directed uh, graph, if you consider these to be nodes. Uh, it can be a regular graph if you consider the sides themselves to be nodes. Um, so if you look at these uh, graphs, you can think about them as being a generalization of a simple DNA sequence. And what's happening is that variations form bubbles in this sequence. So here, where we have a simple SNP, uh, we just have two different paths uh, using different nodes here, different uh, positions, we'll call them, within the reference structure. And here, when we have an option of including or not including the A, uh, we can skip over it. And uh, you'll see other examples where we can have much more complicated structural variations represented by this okay. graph. Yes? Just a simple question. Suppose I've got two SNPs, a strong LD that are 50,000 bases apart. Yes. What do I have? And there's others. We'll get to that. Yes, very good. So in the compressed version of this, uh, you might lose phasing between them because you only have one. Uh, like, for example, here, we lose phasing, any phasing between this variant and this variant because we only have one set of nodes here. But if we replicated all of these nodes between these two, then we would have a phased representation of that. Now, the drawback of that, which is the body of the talk, so you're getting right into this, uh, is that now we have position, we have more and more of the graph that looks identical or very repetitive uh, in that sense. So when we start to tease apart things un, uh, to create phasing, then we get more repetitive structure within the graph. So we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about how to deal with that. Excellent question. Is it clear? Any other question? Because this is, this, yes? Uh, maybe this has to do with what you were just saying. But is there like, um, like a, a probability associated with, with a given arrow connecting? You could. You could put a probability on it. You can put various counts on it. 
All those would be decorations on top of the reference genome that may become standardized at some point, but I want to keep the reference genome definition as simple as possible at this point. So until a community, uh, I mean, that could be community-specific annotation on top of the reference genome, if you will. Because obviously, any probability is going to be population-specific, and you know, it's, it's, it gets a little more complicated when we start to decorate this with other information. Yes. Yes. So the ID will be universally, uh, universally different. And when we start talking about multiple reference graphs, it will be different. And then when I sequence you and I make a graph for you, you'll have a completely new set of IDs. So every base instance in every genome we ever look at, reference or not, has a specific UUID for it. This is the concept. Distinct from all other UUIDs. Yes? The way I would have thought to put it is that there's a universal graph for the universal reference. Yes. And then each individual has two, like, threadings through that graph. Right. We're going to talk about that threading. But we're going to call it a mapping from positions in your graph to positions in the reference graph. So I want every position to have a UUID. So grant me that, OK? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, we're going to use this. All right. Thanks, Carlos. Okay, so um, yeah, the, one of the issues is so how do we map? So this is the question of like, so now you come along with a variant. Uh, so the reference is A, A, G, C, T, A, C, T, blah, blah, blah in some position, and you are this. Okay, and now so some people hate gaps, uh, so they map this with just one gap and forcing the G, forcing this to be a kind of a crazy match here. Other people would say, oh, well, two gaps are fine, and so they're going to map the same DNA sequence like this with two gaps and a nice clean uh, mapping in the middle. All right, we don't want to argue about uh, who's right and who's wrong among the existing methodologies. We want to come up with one methodology that essentially maps places where there's little or no dispute in the entire community, and we'll define a mathematical definition of that we will propose as a reference structure, little or no dispute, and then the rest of them will be left unmapped. And what's going to happen in the end is that most of the stuff will map and nobody will disagree on that, and some of the stuff will have these alternate mappings, but it will be short little pieces now and then. And you'll know that it's unmapped, and you have to think about the possible different mappings of that. So this is a way of not dogmatically forcing every base to map, because you could have weird shit in your genome that just shouldn't map, but trying to get a community agreed upon way of what should map. Now, where are we now? We talk about human variation with these damn VCF files. I hate VCF. I contributed to it grudgingly. But it's a horrible thing, and it tries to describe differences between you, your genome or this genome sample, maybe it's a cancer sample or something, uh, and a reference genome with various notation. And the problem is, is as we added, and, and, and I must admit that our lab is responsible for adding the general breakpoint part to it so that we can do, so that we could do our cancer group and uh, our cancer work, and others could do their cancer work to analyze very complicated uh, rearrangements, and we spent a lot of time on that, but it just proliferated this problem of multiple ways of saying the same thing. So these three little snippets of VCF, this two-line thing uh, being the third, express the same thing, that there's an A in the reference after this T, and it isn't in U, right? So you lost an A somewhere. Uh, okay. All right, if it was this simple, it's fine, but it turns out there's it gets more complicated when you start worrying about left shifting and all this other stuff that people do to try to figure out whether two VCFs are actually talking about the same variant or a different variant. So um, we need to think about how we can take any DNA sequence and map it into our reference. And we are saying that, in fact, a property of the reference genome should be a scheme for mapping any DNA sequence into it. And we call that a reference structure. So it's a reference genome expressed as a graph, sequence graph, plus a rule for mapping any 
position in any DNA sequence into that reference genome. That should be part of the definition of the reference genome that we use as a standard. How would you get some of these things? Well, here's an example of a simple scheme that may or may not be the one that the community adopts, but that at least it is a definition uh, that one could make. We call this unique context strings, and it's very simple. So here is now uh, a reference genome that we saw before, but now it's a reference structure because in the reference genome contain the rules for mapping. The rules for mapping are fairly easy. They're contained in these little strings that you see here, left and right. We call those unique contexts. So here's a position P in the reference genome, and it has this left unique context, AAGC. So what that is is a suffix of a path that leads into this node. Here you see it right here, AAGC leads and ends in the left side of this node. So that's a suffix of a path <coughs> or a thread, as we call them, leading into this uh, node P on the left. And, it, and in fact, it is the shortest such suffix that is not similarly a thread, suffix of a thread leading into the left side of any other node in this graph. Nor is it a suffix of a path leading into the reverse complement of any node. Unfortunately, DNA is double-sided, so we also have to think about that. So in particular, if you look at in the reverse complement direction, if we flip this around and think about this node, Q, but think about it in the reverse complement side, then we're looking at a reverse complement prefix coming in here. And in fact, this tells us that the shorter suffix, A, G, C, before T, wouldn't have worked because its reverse complement, this is the reverse complement A, and then we have C, G, A. So that's match. So the three base context would not be sufficient. You uniquely identified that you're at P on the left. OK? So there's always a shortest thing that identifies uniquely where you are or nothing. So it's possible there isn't anything that uniquely identifies where you are in the string that you're trying to match into this thing. So this thing, this will always exist here and be unique if the graph has some nice properties. Basically, there's no subgraph automorphisms that force things to be you know, if I, if I repeated the same chromosome twice, then there's no way I would get a unique left context, obviously, right? So I won't go into that. There's a nice characterization in terms of automorphisms <laughs> and so forth that, uh, where, you, where, where you always have one of these things. But they're allowed to be empty. But if they're not empty, then they are the shortest thing uh, that identifies this position uniquely as a left context. Now we can do the same thing on the right for symmetry with prefixes. And then we have a very simple rule, right? So consider. So we have the shortest suffix of a subthread ending on the left side of P that's not also uh, on the left side of any other node or is a prefix in the reverse complement. And then we do the same thing on the right. So then we have the shortest right prefixes. And then we have a very simple <coughs> mapping rule. So positions, this is an arbitrary genome G, a thread. This is a linear genome G, and it's mapping into this reference genome. So a position P will map to a position M of P, the mapping, the unique mapping position for that, which can be undefined in some cases. Um, and it does so either by being triggered by a match on the right or triggered by a match on the left. Yes? Just a quick question. As your genome evolves, I mean, you add more nodes to it, yes. your context strings will change, right? Yes. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, the rule is simply that if, if you look at a position P, it will match so long as it doesn't fail to match for any context on the left and any context on the right, then it's unmapped. Or there's one more case, it could map to one node on the left, but a different node on the right. So in that case, we say it's unmapped as well. Otherwise, we have obviously a unique mapped position. And because of the way we designed these little context strings, you can't map two places on the left. Or you can't, and you can't map two places on the right. So either you're mapped uniquely or you're not mapped. 
So very simple mapping scheme just by exact matching. And we try to make, obviously, by choosing the smallest context, we try to make as much mappable as possible. We could use larger context if we wanted to be more stringent. But we want to map as much as we can. So what happens when it's a graph, your, your question? This is two questions about this. So if the reference sequence is a graph, then what's going to happen for a particular node is that you might have multiple contexts on the left by taking different paths into that node. So what we're going to allow in general is to have a context set. So essentially, suffixes of those paths can be chosen to be unique among all context sets, not also be suffixes of other context sets of other nodes. And those then not are be, triggers. Not to be in the set, in other words. You, want to be, you, you, you don't want any string in your context set here, your left context set here, to also be a suffix of a string in some other node's left context set. Because then you would potentially be into a dual matching problem. So they have to be long enough not to be suffixes of somebody else's context set on the left side. And similarly for the right context sets. And then you simply trigger a match if you match to any one in the suffix set. So previously, we only had one thing to match to for every position in the reference genome. We had one unique context string. Now we have several unique context strings that are sufficiently long to uniquely trigger a match to that position. And the same rule again. You can match on the left or the right. We call those a left matching or a right matching. And you can see the little, that's a left matching. Um, a right matching, and some of these are in both, in the sense that there's all, there's, they're actually you're uniquely identified both on the left and the right. You have the correct thing, but to the same node, right? Otherwise, you would not be mapped. So you can see, uh, in this case, again, it's a little dense. You can go through this thing and see um, where things map or don't map, right? So there, there can be there's places down here that don't map uniquely, and then there's unambiguous places that map either on the left or the right. And so this DNA sequence will map into this uh, reference structure. And the reference structure is a composite of two haplotypes where, to, again, apologies, we've lost phasing because we've squashed them together. Yes? Um, what if you have highly repetitive regions? Do you just need very long contexts? Right. Or? Excellent. Perfect. Uh, we'll get to that slide after this. Thank you. So um, you can also say, it, to get to full generality, I might want to map a sequence represented by a graph, because I did some sequencing, and I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't completely resolve your genome, and I get a graph out of it. And I want to map that graph to the reference graph. And so we, then we just uh, ask you to be able to match every, some, to find a unique suffix that covers all the paths coming into you on the left, triggering a match to a node in the graph. So we want you to match unambiguously in that sense. So we can generalize this to graph-to-graph -graph matching, which is the most general uh, framework for it. So um, what about unaligned positions? And these come about when there's a lot of repetition in the, in the reference genome, especially if you don't want the context strings to be enormous, right? So if, if I had you know, very, very long identical pieces of DNA in my reference genome, I would have to, the context would have to be even longer than that in order to be unique. Those are huge contexts, so what if you don't want the context string, no one of these tr unique triggering context strings to be longer than M bases for some reasonably small M, then um, what happens is you can do merging, essentially. So I create a more abstract graph for my reference by merging two nodes together, if they have these very long, if in order to disambiguate them, I would have to have extremely long left context, then screw it. I'm going to merge them together to be one, to be represented by one node in my reference, which is essentially kind of what we're doing when we were doing this uh, merging of the haplotypes, right? I don't, want to, I don't want to have such a long stretch of nodes to remember haplotype phasing. I'm merging them together so that now in that structure, it only requires a small sequence. But at the same time, I'm also merging these nodes that are repetitive in the reference structure. So the reference structure becomes more, much more graphy um, than it was before when we do this. 
And as you keep going down to this, um, where you have this upper limit, eventually you're going to say, well, if I'm in a context of one, then I have to merge. And you end up with just two nodes, two non-trivial nodes. This dollar sign was a telomere symbol to indicate the end. That's not a real node in this thing. Um, so there's the AT node, A in its reverse complement, and the CG node, and that's all. Right? So the whole, collapse, the whole graph collapses down to essentially two nodes. It seems like there would be a much more representation if you get a, put a substring and then say 15 base pairs away is an A. Right. A so it, rather than, rather than rather saying what's in between. Or 20 right. Long. Yeah. yeah. So that could avoid this. That, that, you, so you could still tolerate these uh, long, ma those long yeah. matching triggers uh, without literally having them. That's true, but there's also a, a reason why we, but the problem is if I only have a smaller read, then I can't resolve it. And I do still want to map somewhere in the reference genome. So if I said, oh no, I want this 1,000 base pair or 10,000 base pair left context, that region may only occur twice in the genome. And I, if I have a 100 base pair read in it, I can't map that read. <laughs> because there's two different places. There's two copies of this 10,000 base pair region. But after I collapse it, I'm happy because that 100 base read might match to position 735 within this thing. And, and that's a useful thing to me. So you kind of want to have your cake and eat it too. And I'm going to describe how to do that here. So the problem with this is that it seems like we're stuck between an overly collapsed thing and an under collapsed thing, and we're not happy either way. So create a hierarchy. There really, we tried to avoid this, right? But, but there, really, there really is a fundamentally hierarchical, hierarchical way that we think about these graphs. So we saw a, an example of a hierarchy as we collapse more and more According to M, we got more general graphs. So let's formalize that. So this is the kind of the mathematical definition for this in generality. You have the sequence graph, and we have these notions of these threads coming in and ending at the left end of a node. So I, let's take any two graphs, G and H. So we say a position P in a graph G is less than or equal to a position Q in a graph H. If both of those positions have the same base, and every suffix ending on the left side of P is also a suffix ending on the left side of Q. So Q just has more suffixes than P did on the left side. And the same thing happens with prefixes on the right. And sorry, I hate DNA. Or the similar thing happens with the reverse complement. right? So you have, to, you have to throw that in as well. Um, so it's a very natural definition of generalization. Basically, you're more general. That node is more general if it has more suffixes leading into it or, and prefixes on the other side. And then we can say that a graph is more general than another graph if for every, no, every position P in the graph G, there exists a unique Q in the graph H, which will denote F of P with P less than or equal to Q. So that means that. I can map up to the more general graph unambiguously. That creates a hierarchy. And this is essentially what we were dealing with. So that uh, structure turns out to be very, very nice for mapping. The, yes. the index here, 1, 2, and so on, is the k is So we could, but this is <laughs> abstract. And I don't think we want to, we definitely do not want to restrict this just to k or m -mers. Um so this is a very, very general mathematical construct. And so any way you want a collapsing nodes or together would create a hierarchy like this, as long as you're careful to ensure the uniqueness of your more general node. And again, that has to do with subgraph automorphisms and so forth that I'm not getting into at this point. But it's very easy to control for that. So this is now a reference hierarchy where this, would, this might be your genome with highly resolved haplotypes. And this might be your genome with less resolved haplotypes. This might be your genome with two separate representations of one of Ed Evan Eichler's you know, big repetitive region. And this might be your genome where they're collapsed into one part of the graph. So 
the nice, what is the nice mathematical property of this hierarchy as I've defined it? It's transitive mapping. This is really what you want out of this thing. So again, this is the hierarchy. We have the most resolved uh, genome down here and the most collapsed genome up here. And if you have any other graph outside of this, some other graph G that's an input graph, not in the reference, and I want to map a position P into this reference, if I can map it somewhere to a, 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 a Q in H, at some position Q in some HI, then I want to be able to say that I will also map it to F of Q in the next one, HJ, and higher. Right? So if I map somewhere in this, I want to map to the corresponding more general node, which is unique in this hierarchy by definition, all the way up, which means that everything Every position in every possible graph for every possible human DNA experiment is either not going to map anywhere into this hierarchy, or it's going to map to a, a most specific place in this hierarchy, and then automatically, transitivity, transitively map everything more general up. So I only need to actually map where the, it most specifically maps within this hierarchy, and everything else follows from the function f that takes me to more general places in the hierarchy. That has a great um, possibility. <coughs> and uh, there's an easy way to get it from the left context sets and right context that we were defining. You can do that at H1, the most resolved case. Or in fact, you can do any mapping you want at that case. But the nice one is this left context, right unique context mapping to think about. And then you simply define the left and right context for the higher ones by taking the union of the context sets from the lower one. And then the cool thing you can do with that is you can minimize them further because they may now have redundant long suffixes. But after you collapse things, you probably don't need as much context anymore. So you can chew back the context strings as you go up, and they become shorter. And there's a, a unique way to do that, right? You chew them back as far as you can so that they still don't map anywhere else. Very, very simple intuition for that. So this is a canonical way. And it tells me, in <coughs> fact, that we're always looking at the, at, at the F inverse of Q, right? The things that all, all the things that will map up to Q in terms of creating this union. And it also tells me that if I'm mapping into Q, then if I want to know where I might map to the ones below, I can look at F inverse. I can go back down here. And this has the nice property that if you get down to the bottom and you don't map anywhere, you can still get a set of positions where you almost map, but you didn't have enough context. It's the F inverse thing. right? Your context was too short to uniquely map, but there's only a few places where you could map. And so you get a definition of multi-mapping out of this in those cases, which is rigorous. So there's no dispute about, oh, I say it multi-maps to these three places, and somebody else says, no, it multi-maps to these five places. It only multi-maps one way in this thing if it multi-maps. So it uniquely maps, it comes in, and um, multi-maps, and that's shown by these little, uh, little light-colored arrows in some places down here, which means it doesn't really map, but it would multi-map if you were coming back down. And it, otherwise, this string, the positions in this string are going to map somewhere. Now, the nice part about this graph is that it, the, the collapse level here was made from two haplotypes, this one and this one, essentially by merging. And this is a, uh, a result of a crossover between these two. And so it, it does a funny thing when it's mapping to either of these haplotypes by itself, but it does the natural thing after you collapse them. It just maps essentially straight across. And then as we get more abstract, assuming that we're collapsing like uh, long repeats within the genome at this level, then we get a more, even more compressed matching phenomenon at the top level. And we're actually proposing essentially a three-level architecture for the reference genome as a minimal architecture. At the bottom, you would be, there would be lots of actual genomes with heavily resolved haplotypes and, and a lot of structure. At the, at the next level, you would, you would merge uh, 
orthologous positions as much as you wanted to, but resist merging pyrologous regions. And then at the high level, you would go ahead and merge pyrologous regions as well. And that probably would handle most of our, most of our traffic. All right, so actually, before, before we do this, is there any, are there any questions about the idea? OK, so um, we've started to implement this. And this is uh, so uh, Benedict and uh, my co-authors, Benedict Payton. And uh, this is work by Adam. Um, and uh, um, Frank uh, Nothoff. And, and uh, we have uh, an implementation that comes off the Berkeley stack. So Frank said uh, in the Dave Patterson lab, and um, we have uh, a, a beautiful system that's set up for not doing large file processing, but for actually doing computation at scale on very large data sets. Um, Mesos and Hadoop you're probably familiar with at the low level, but then uh, Berkeley has added Spark on top of Hadoop, which uh, is a much more flexible uh, kind of uh, than, than, than your vanilla MapReduce kind of thing in terms of parallelizing. Uh, operations, and then on top of that, they've added this great package, GraphX, which you can imagine we're thrilled with that because there's a ton of graph stuff in this. Uh, so to do million node graphs or 10 million node graphs, I mean, one needs to to have some fancy stuff. And so um, Adam Novak has created this uh, sequence graph API on top of that and some user code. And um, I won't go into the details of how this is stored, but the nice part about this, and it's used for uh, the, the Berkeley read store as well. Um, the actual DNA is stored in a columnar format, essentially. So you're thinking about everything that aligns to a certain position uh, being local over a large group of genomes, um, rather than every genome being uh, organized horizontally uh, within the storage. And this gives you um, a nice architecture then for rapidly accessing and doing a project. So now when you think about mapping a DNA sequence, so here's a DNA sequence um, that we're trying to map to the reference, G, A, T, G, A, C. And this position G doesn't map to the reference, but these positions do map, these positions do map. What do we do? In fact, if this is a VCF, often this stuff here is what we call an anchor. Because if you don't say anything in VCF over a long region, then it's kind of saying, well, I just have the reference for this region. So we call that an anchor, and there's a huge, there are huge anchors within a VCF. And then when it get gets to the VCF code like we saw before that's trying to describe the variant, that's when things get hairy. Uh, so we know where the anchors map. Um, and using this uh, sequence graph package, um, we're trying to get down to where the variable parts map. Now, uh, so between the two of them, between Frank and Adam, they've got uh, an import VCF and an export VCF working. In, or, in order to test it in the current pipelines, we have to read it into the internal format and then write the thing out again as some kind of normalized VCF, unfortunately, because nobody reads. We haven't finished the API for the direct thing. But it does this fast. Uh, so even for this 5.1 gigab gigabyte VCF, um, which is telling you uh, a lot about every base in the genome, essentially. In this case, uh, it's only four and a half minutes to import. And when you take this VCF, you can get away. This is a reprise of this nasty example, three different ways to do it. We get away from that, and we actually decode the VCF into what string they're actually talking about. So in this case, you're talking about these strings that get mapped canonically according to the context rules that I just described. And, you'll, and these end up being mapping to UUID 98, 99, 100, 102, 103. Because remember, what this VCF was trying to say is that typically there's an A after this T, and it's not there in my genome. Um, and that ends up being written out in a canonical way. So the bottom line is that we can do this at scale. The nice part about using an exact matching criterion is that there are FM index, suffix tree. There's a whole world of uh, wonderful, extremely fast data structures because exact string matching is an old and venerable part of computer science. Uh, and we have highly refined implementations of this at this point. 
Uh, the FM index implementation is pre-alpha at this point, but we hope to release it. And then to try this, this is actually describing an earlier run before we had some of the things I told you about, but we try this to do it at scale on MHC. So the last part of the talk was describing the major histocompatibility complex. Now, as you know, in the previous version, HG19, we had already eight different haplotypes uh, that are fully sequenced uh, haploid or monoploid pieces of DNA for the MHC region. You can get eight more by looking at Craig Venter or other kind of uh, celebrity genomes. <laughs> and that uh, gets us to 16 high coverage samples. There's another run that Benedict did where we were actually including uh, uh, other thousand genomes data in this as well. But uh, this was enough variation. And um, you can see that after you sort out all the bases and all the variation and so forth, there's a substantial amount that is different between these. So there, there are about 5% of the bases that are only in one of the 16 versions of this region. That's a lot of DNA. And some of that's in genes in interesting <coughs> regions. Um, and there's uh, 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 almost 6% uh, that occurs in two of these samples, but not in the reference genome. This is HG19 or GRCH37. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that's not being compared between samples because it doesn't map to that current reference genome, and hopefully this will cease to be a problem. Uh, and then there's this nice tool, and I hope we, that we can get this out there or people are starting to use it, but there's now an, an assembly hub that you can put your DNA sequences on, a bunch of related uh, DNA sequences. You can choose one to be the reference and the others to align to it, and then you can look at how they align with these things called snake graphs, which the red means there's a mismatch, the blue is a nice match, and then this one goes, oh, this, this, this line says this DNA that's mapping to this reference up here, not shown, um, is, goes over here and then goes reverse complement and then continues like this. So it's a little inversion and then it's missing some stuff that normally would map to the reference. And it's kind of fun. We call these snake diagrams because you can see the rearrangements cause the DNA sequence to map discontinuously in some interesting pattern. And... Uh, if you look at this in a hypervariable region, all the red, again, shows you the mismatch. And so there is quite a lot of structural difference. And this includes some of the short read sets where we, we've mapped, but we're missing information, so the contig ends. Uh, so you, can't, you don't get as much contiguity here, but you still get information out of these short, shorter read contig sets. Uh, so thanks. Yes. So um, I'd, just, I'd just like to begin by briefly advertising a project going on in David yes. Wright's lab, uh, funded by Jim Simons, which seems appropriate to mention in this building. Excellent, yes. Um, uh, where we're doing um, high genome coverage of uh, 350 genomes uh, from many, many populations. Yes. And um, uh, one of our problems uh, is that um, uh, we're currently mapping to uh, current human genome reference, yes. and extremely concerned about not introducing reference bias, because um, the whole idea is to build this data set as a, as a yes. resource for population genetics. Absolutely. And so you talked, mostly in your talk, you were talking about computer science here. Yes. But um, I wondered if you could comment on um, what genomes you're going to build to, to, use, to actually use for your reference graph. Yes. For example, I would love in some ideal sense, take our 350 uh, genomes and build some giant graph using your stuff. I mean, I've no I idea would love that too. <laughs> <laughs> I would very much love to do that. Yes, I think this is. I think this is an incredibly important decision, and I view this as a very important community decision. Work, you know, working with the Reference Genome Consortium to actually think. Okay, if we if we are capable of representing more human variation in our reference hierarchy, if you accept the idea that we want a reference hierarchy and we are capable of using graphs to represent more variation, then what would be our standard set for which we would build this? And it would be great. You could put your 350 at the bottom and then merge up. So uh, yes? A further comment on that is humbly as an working with yes. in our group and is interested in working, I know, with you is talking yes, about Hung, this. Yes, Hung is on the committee that we're talking about this on at the Global Alliance, and he's giving us his Hung feedback, <laughs> which is always very, very precise and incisive. Yes. 
so, so he's also interested in trying to use these 350 genomes in some yes. way, and so if you could influence him to uh, use these 350 okay. genomes in an interesting way, so Great. If, if it's interesting and valuable, then he would like he would like to try to use it, but it, uh, in some way. So that's great. It's, I mean, it's I, that's very much available for this. In terms of interest. We're looking for an alpha project, or maybe a beta project. I think we, you know, we'll start with a really small alpha project, uh, and then that would be a beta project that would be very, very appropriate. And before the larger community will ever accept this, we have to have done some pretty thorough implementations of it. This 350 seems like at scale, real, real stuff. Uh, that'd be great. Yes. David, at the beginning, you mentioned a little bit about the, the data representation in the sort of broader, essentially the whole world of right. genomic data. And you mentioned that there would be, uh, a, you mentioned, I, if I'm sure right, a significant sort of commercial uh, enterprise side to that, which we all know is, is burgeoning right. now. Yes. And I'm just, but uh, I, this presentation never got back to what data structures those folks want and well, will we're, use. So there's a group on the API that's uh, on, on that <coughs> that's led currently by uh, Dave Patterson here at Berkeley, actually, and, and has participation from uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and increasingly we're adding other companies as well as a number of labs. And we'll grow this to have a uh, interest group that is unbounded around it as soon as we can post first standards. But that <coughs> the idea of that group is to define what the API, what the data model and API operations would look like, that it is <clears throat> more abstract than this is BCF or this is BAM, you know, live with it. Um, so, but, but what's the relationship of that group? Is that group related to this? So this would, just, this would, this would, this I mean, this doesn't look like a typical, you know, sort of highly distributed data structure. No, no, this group, this interfaces with that group in a sm relatively small overlap where yeah. they ask, how do you, re how do you uh, represent uh, the alignment to the reference genome? So I'm, we're proposing this as the scheme, but uh, that group, that other group has to deal with a lot more issues than just how to map to the reference genome, which is the sole focus of my talk today. Yeah. Um, those issues being... You know, what are the what are the elementary API calls that you want to make? So, what type of queries? If we break down what we all do into a set of queries that form a, a language for interfacing with one of these databases, what are those? What's the right factoring of this into an API and a data model? Well, from so a research that, standpoint, what's really important is that that API reference. If this is the next generation of of a sort of correct or optimal representation of genomes. Yes then it seems to me that the community needs to really press hard that these large enterprise investments where most of the sequencing will take exactly. place yes. actually do have something more than very expensive tags that sort that's of right. gratuitously reference some research object. No, no, that's absolutely true. And, and you know, it's exactly what we're trying to deal with. Uh, there, there's it's a huge proliferation of different standards and uh, confusion of the back-end implementation with the actual interface. And until there is a widely accepted interface, uh, there will be uh, confusion in that, in that regard. So we want, we want to be able to have a world in which there can be shared data sets, some of which may be in companies, uh, some of which may be at institutes like the EBI. Um, and those are available through a common API interface that one can say, okay, I want to do this query or that query on these databases because that's what my code does, and it's all code-driven uh, retrieval of data from these databases. Um, we have to get to that point. It's not an easy thing. But if we get enough players together to agree on an API, then they all build the backends to that API, then we might actually have exchangeability and compatibility. Yeah. So this uh, reference uh, genome, is it made up only of celebrities or also uh, ordinary <laughs> mortals? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, it, it, it's, these, this is just an idea. So the reference genome uh, of the future has yet to be built. Now, the reference genome of today is still largely based on most of it's the guy from Buffalo who will never really know. Uh, and I think it's like 70% um, the guy from Buffalo uh, estimate. Craig Winter is not. Craig didn't make it, no. Uh, 
you know, he doesn't think it was a great The library bit, couldn't fight through, huh? <laughs> but, uh, you know, but the, 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 what the current reference genome consortium is working off is not Craig. It's mainly the guy from Buffalo. You have to put, <laughs> you have to put people from across a, a big spectrum of fitness or whatever, diseases or, you know, ages. Yeah, well, one would want to. Um, in fact, our, our feeling about this is that we wouldn't necessarily only start with whole genomes at the bottom layer uh, because dbSNP has a bunch of information that consists of a large context on the left then a particular point variant, and then a large context on the right. Well, that can be raw material at H1, the H1 level, and then it just creates a bubble when you merge it in up there. And so I don't have to have whole genomes at the bottom level. And that's important, and that will allow us to get more variation in. So I don't think we have to decide, is it Craig in or out, or is it, is it just Craig and Watson, or you know, who has the star power to be in the bottom layer? You know, that, that should be avoidable. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if this is interesting, but one, one query you'd like to do is once you have two individuals represented in this way, to yes. compare them. Yes. So identity by descent blocks. And so That's right. Is, is there a specific yes. interest in computer science? Yeah, I think it brings up a lot of issues there. So the fundamental thing we have here is that you have these two individuals, and then you have uh, a, 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 the uniquely mapping parts of them. And you can go through and kind of check, check boxes that they all agree on most of those. And so that would be the kind of boring part, which the two individuals are essentially identical. And then what you're left is, is little threads of nodes. They tend to come in little groups within the genomes that don't map into the reference structure, the reference hierarchy that you have um, anywhere, or they map very high up, uh, so where there's lots of loopiness. And so then, you, then it's a great computer science problem how to then do the comparison. Uh, you can essentially say, okay, these, the, I have a, an anchor, I have an, an anchor, it's an overused word of anchor, I have a solid mapping on the left and the right of this little stretch of DNA into the reference, and then the same pattern occurs over here with this other individual, solid mapping here into the same positions of the reference, and now you're, you've kind of narrowed it down to a relatively short piece of DNA where they're different. And then you would then go through uh, a well-defined routine for dealing with, so how is that segregating and so forth. To the extent that you had a richness in this hierarchy of population-specific stuff, you could do all kinds of interesting analysis down there. And I, the other thing, if it isn't obvious, that I'm really excited about with this is that it doesn't separate out single nucleotide variation from structural variation. I'm very frustrated with the fact that we're almost getting two different worlds. And the fact is, it's just variation, people. You know, it's just different DNA. We can't kind of totally separate our tools out into one or the other. All right, I've been on my soapbox long enough. Thanks.